we're really the party with a vested interest in the next generation. We have a special priority for what happens after us. The Democrats are the party of transgendered individuals and uh, euthanasia and abortion, which is to say they're the party of infertility and death. But we have a special mission for the next generation. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback, Johnny Burtka, and Nate Hockman. Today, our guest is Frank Buckley, who is the foundation professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason, Mason University. He's a senior editor at The American Spectator and a frequent writer for many publications. He's appeared on cable television as a frequent media guest. In addition, he has authored a number of books, including The Way Back, Restoring the Promise of America, The Once and Future King, The American Illness, and his most recent book, which is the subject of today's episode, Progressive Conservatism. How Republicans Will Become America's Natural Governing Party. Thanks for being with us, Frank. Thank you for having me. Before we get to our interview, we'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Frank, could you start by telling us a little about your book, Progressive Conservatism, which kind of reads like a pl- political platform for 2024? And so perhaps it can give us some insights and what to how to kind of navigate the uh, the American political scene and landscape and preparation for for that upcoming year. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it was, I hope, also the roadmap. Well, it was certainly the roadmap for 2016. I hope it will be for 2024 if we want to retain the Trump voters who came to the party in mass in 2016. The term progressive conservatism will seem like an oxymoron to many people. We have been, uh, we have learned that progressivism is the creature of the left and it's behind all sorts of nasty things. But in fact, you don't understand the Republican party unless you understand the progressive elements. And if you don't understand the idea of progressive conservatism, that means you have an imperfect understanding of progressivism, conservatism, the GOP, and I think of America as well. And part of our problem here is that conservatives tend to be theoretical and ahistorical, but with a broader view of what the GOP has been all about, you'll recognize the progressive parts of it. And of course, you'll have seen that what progressivism means in the left is anything but progressive, right? I mean, if you are... If, if, if the point of politics is to pit one race against another or one ethnic group against another, what's progressive about that? It's, it's not modern. It's pre-modern. It's Neanderthal. It's the way politics was conducted 4,000 years ago, right? I mean, so, you know, nothing progressive about that or wanting to shut down people who disagree with you. But progressivism does have a distinct meaning for conservatives. And I think one way to think of this is to imagine American politics along a east-west continuum rather than north-south. So what do I mean by west versus east? What I mean is the west of Frederick Jackson Turner, the great American historian. And Turner's thesis was that America was born on the frontier and that which is good about America, distinctive about it, came from progressives in the West. And what was he thinking of? He was thinking of equality, opportunity in the West, as opposed to an aristocratic East. And he was thinking of Republican virtue as opposed to a corrupt East. So that's an important part of the GOP. And you tend to forget about it. People forget, for example, that initiative and referendum laws are, number one, ordinarily a pretty good thing opposed by the left, uh, and the invention of Western progressives, right? They, 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 you know, the progressives thought you're not going to have too much of a good thing like democracy, so let's have more of it, right? And by contrast, the East, they said, was aristocratic, immobile, uh, and we in the West were the party of mobility. So I'm originally from the West. I feel that very strongly. I feel that sense of difference. And I feel that it's been lost by in a, in a theoretical GOP. 
So we've lost trace of an important part of our heritage and an important part of, of what conservatism means, because all of the things I've described are conservative. In particular, you know, the idea that it's really important to live in a mobile society. Our, our problem in America today, a big problem is the lack of intergenerational mobility. Okay, the, the mobility that matters is not moving up the ranks during your life. It's about your kids. So the idea of the American dream is that whoever you are, wherever you live, your kids will have it better than you will. Now, in 2014, when polled, we, told, we said we don't believe that anymore. Uh, George Carlin said the reason they call it the American dream is you have to be asleep to believe in it. And indeed, the American dream has moved to other countries. Amongst first world countries, we're one of the most aristocratic. I mean, I moved here from Canada and I sensed immediately, oh, this is a class society. It was very different. It felt different. OK. Uh, and that's not good. Right. I mean, we if we're the country of the American dream, how shameful is it to see that other countries are much more mobile than we are? OK. And in 2016, amongst the Republican candidates, only one person saw this as, a, as an issue and they elected him president. And I saw this close up because I was a Trump speechwriter, a Trump advisor. I helped craft campaign themes. We made American mobility, the lack of mobility, a big part of the campaign. And, and, and people recognized it as a viable issue. We're still immobile. And this still has to be a part of a 2024 uh, Republican campaign. You were going to ask a question. Yeah. Frank, real quick, before we get to whether or not the American dream is viable for today and sort of what that means for the Republican Party in the next election, I'm wondering if you could touch historically first on the historic sort of party of Lincoln. You know, when I think of the historic Republican Party, I, I guess I don't think of the West as much. I sort of think of, you know, sort of these industrial titans who, you know, are, are on the East Coast who have you know, are sort of protected behind a wall of tariffs and, and, um, you know, who, who garnered to some, they built up national power, uh, to a large extent made America one of the greatest manufacturing powers on earth. But at same, at the same time, they came under a lot of heat from, uh, pr the prairie populace, William Jennings Bryan, who I, you know, associate more obviously with the Democratic Party in the West. So maybe could you touch historically a little bit about that tension and, yeah, uh, conservatives, right wingers tend to be Manichaeans who see uh, Teddy Roosevelt's progressivism as the time, the moment when it all went to hell, right? And I, I want to push back against that. I want to suggest that there were two different kinds of progressivism. One was that of a fellow called Herbert Crowley, who was associated with TR at one point and who believed in simply a top-down regulated economy run by experts. But there was another kind of progressivism created by the great progressive historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, which was more individualistic. And, and T.R. was a, an extraordinary figure in some respects on both sides of that one, but mostly as president on the side of an individualistic kind of progressivism. So he didn't believe in, for example, breaking up the monopolies. He believed in, in regulating them. And the regulation he had in mind mostly was campaign finance reform, right? We'll get to that, I guess, in a moment, because, I, I, you know, because if you identify yourself as a Westerner and you're looking at the East, it's not just that the East is aristocratic and class-bound, as America is, but it's also corrupt. And Republicans have taken a pass on the issue of corruption. They've let the issue of corruption be uh, argued for by Nancy Pelosi's Democrats. How stupid is that? Right. Uh, you know, you know, draining the swamp was a big issue in 2016. Draining the swamp meant something. It was not taken up by the GOP at any point in the last, you know, e even under uh, even between 2017 and 2019, but it should be very much a Republican issue, right? And what we should be doing, for example, is taking on the lobbyists. 
or closing the revolving door between Congress and K Street. So those are good conservative themes. They're progressive themes. You know, one thing about progressive conservatism is the point is we don't want the left to be the sole agent of change because they're going to muck it up, right? Uh, change should come from us more than from them because we know better that which works than they do. So, um, and as that the first great progressive conservative, Edmund Burke, said, a society without the principle of change doesn't have the principle of conservation in it. So you, you've got to have both. You've got to have a party who both knows how to conserve things and, and how to reform where reform is needed. And And, and that was... You know, that was the Trump victory in 2016. I wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal back then. I did a chart with four quadrants, and the winning quadrant was the upper left, which was socially conservative and economically middle of the road. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about, right? Progressive with respect to economic reform, conservative with respect to social values. That was the sweet spot in American politics in 2016. It still is that. And to its credit, I think ISI has recognized that. I think ISI is not simply, you know, a a right-wing libertarian party, uh, if ever it was simply that. Um, And so we've got to roll with the demand of the populace to embrace that which is good in America, but also to reform where reform is needed, as as it is. You know, the the thing about um, mobility and why it's so important abstractly and strategically is when you think about the barriers to mobility, they're creatures of the left. What is it which keeps us immobile? What is it which tends towards immobility? Firstly, immigration. We actually import immobility, right? The people who come to us will earn less than Native Americans. So will their children. So will their grandchildren. So you know, the effect of immobility will persist through generations. By contrast, in countries that adopt uh, the point system, you're going to import people on the basis that they'll make Native Canadian Americans better off. And I mean, this was this came from a progressive conservative government in Canada in, around 1960, uh, and it's subsequently been exported to Australia. And in my book, The Way Back, I described it and Trump, uh, you know, I I said, this is what we have to do. And they agreed. And and Trump uh, signaled in Facebook that he thought this was a great idea. But, you know, we're we're called the stupid, not for, you know, with reason, the GOP is called the stupid party. So when something like the point system was proposed by Tom Cotton, it got only 33 senators behind it, 33 G- Republican senators behind it. That should have been a no-brainer. Uh, so immigration is an issue for the GOP if we want to make the country more mobile. Education, well, the other guys are the, the party of the, uh, of the teachers' unions. So we're the party of a better immigration system. You know, it's how... People don't realize exactly how bad things are. A majority of Americans can't read past the grade six level. I mean, that should be absolutely shocking. I mean, we, you know, every other country in the world beats, every other first world country darn near beats us massively in terms of literacy and numeracy. And we lead the world only in arrogance, in self-esteem. I mean, that's pretty sick, okay? And so, you know, we haven't really properly taken those guys on. What we should be doing is saying, you pass yourself off or you try to pass yourself off as a party of equality and mobility, but in fact, you're nothing better than vile hypocrites who deserve to be despised by ordinary Americans. We need politicians who are willing to talk like that. But we're too darn gentlemanly, with the exception of Trump. Okay, and uh, you know I'm not arguing for Trump, by the way. I, I'd not want to see him run again. I hope he doesn't. I think the January sixth commission, by the way, will the hearings may perhaps redound to the benefit of the GOP if they persuade most most voters that Trump's time has passed. 
because anyone else will beat any Democrat in 2024, with the exception of Trump. So for those people who say, gee, I, I want Trump to run again, what I hear them saying is I want Biden to win. But anyway, so getting back to mobility, the other issue here is the regulatory state. So you can, you, you can attack the regulatory state for the way in which it hinders ordinary Americans. But you can also say, what about the kids, right? I mean, we're really the party with a vested interest in the next generation. We have a, a special priority for you know, what happens after us. The Democrats are the party of transgendered individuals and uh, euthanasia and abortion, which is to say they're the party of infertility and death. But we have a special mission for the next generation. And I don't think we appreciate so much the genetic impulse behind it. I don't think we quite realize how important that is in our thinking. You know, uh, uh, unless that genetic impulse was there, um, unless the genes didn't tell us to go out and have kids, there'd be no reason to do so. There wouldn't be enough reason to do so. So we're motivated by things we scarcely understand. And one of them is a concern for, for children, for our children, and for the next generation. Um, in a party that's obsessed with only what's happening now, that doesn't matter. And even the Republicans share that. The libertarian part of the Republican Party shares that too much. So that requires, I think, a, a focus on mobility as, as a key issue. And, and that's, you know, and, and, and Lincoln was the guy behind it all. In a, in a speech on July 4, 1861 to Congress, Lincoln said, this is essentially a people's contest. We want to preserve the union, but it's not just about slavery. It's about equality of opportunity for everybody, white or black. So the issue transcended slavery. What was at the core of Lincoln's thinking was how ordinary people, everyone, can get ahead, even as he did from a hard scrabble farm. Frank, I'm glad you brought up the um, the Burke quote because I was going to ask you about that: a state without the means of some changes, without the means of its own preservation. Because I think it's interesting when people reckon with the concept of progress as a conservative value, because progress, obviously, since the rise of progressivism, has been associated with the unconservative aims of progressivism. But in, in trying to sort of understand how progressive conservatism can still be conservative, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'll read a, a quick excerpt from the description of your book, um, and then I wanted to ask you a question about it. So the excerpt about the book is, the Republican Party must return to its roots as a progressive conservative party that defends the American dream, the idea that whoever you are, you can get ahead and know that your children will have it better than you did. It must show how the Democrats have become the party of inequality and immobility and that they created what structural racism exists through their unjust education, immigration, and job killing policies. So the first sort of two thirds of that makes sense to me. I think caring about the sort of the, uh, the alienation of the bottom two thirds of American society from the elite is something conservatives should care about. I wonder though, if sort of seeding the premise on structural racism, you can point out that a lot of democratic policies are bad for non-white Americans, for you know, inner city blacks, for example. But to point out that they, or to call them structurally racist, to me seems to be potentially veering into seeding the premise that America is structurally racist based on the fact that sort of disparate outcomes between groups is inherently evidence of racism in policy. And I wonder if that's something that maybe conservatives should be wary of. No, I don't think so. I think conservatives should embrace the idea of structural racism and then ask, who do you think built the structure? We're not talking about measuring outcomes as evidence of, of racism. What we're talking about are real life differences in policies which harm African-Americans. Right. So, you know, you mentioned a few things. Education is going to be part of it. Immigration is a huge part of it. Right. Um, 
George Borjas, the best immigration economist, has calculated that our immigration policies, that is legal immigration, represent a massive wealth transfer from poor to rich Americans. And the effect is mostly felt, most importantly felt, especially felt by African Americans. So there are a good many ways in which um, our policies benefit a liberal elite and harm minorities, right? And and that was uh, importantly reversed by Trump. I mean, if you want to look for evidence of, uh, you know, of, of, of prejudice, of, of, of the ways in which African Americans have suffered, you won't find them in the Bureau of Labor Statistics under Trump. So, yeah, um, structural racism. I think, once again, it's important to take language the left thinks it owns and turn it into their faces and say, oh, yeah, do you want to talk about that? Let's talk about your role in this. Don't be frightened of things like that. Don't be frightened by mere words. I, so it, it makes sense to me, of course, to talk about how democratic policies hurt black Americans, for example. But to me, I mean, I'm curious what your operating definition of structural racism is, because to me, that implicates an indictment to a certain extent of America by calling them, if America is, is a structurally racist country, that is ceding a pretty important point to the cultural left, no? No, I don't think so. I think that what you're doing is you're buying into the left's language itself. And I, I want very much to say, no, no, not at all. I want to say that if there's a problem here with the structure, what we're talking about specifically are American policies which harm African Americans. They exist and they're the creature of the left. That, that's that's all I'm saying. And you want to say, I think uh, wrongly, that that means an indictment of America per se. Well, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, did I say anything like that? I don't think so. Shifting gears a little bit, part two of your book is you mentioned the American dream and there's a critique of American aristocracy. So could you describe a little bit aristocracy in America, especially when we do have a kind of governing governing class that is perhaps uh, some would argue in the private sector? Um, so some may say, you know, Silicon Valley has um, to some degree and, and these concentrated the concentrated power that has come from a lot of uh, that segment of 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 uh, Menlo Park and the Bay, Bay Area and San Francisco. So how, how would you measure American aristocracy today? Does it still exist? Is it just oligarchs? How would, what, would you, um, what would your answer to that be? Well, I think what you want to do is look for empirical evidence. And you'll find the empirical evidence by comparing us to other countries. And what I'm talking about specifically is the correlation between earnings of children and parents. So that correlation... Uh, if you look at the evidence across country, we're kind of up there with England and the big winners in terms of the mobility rankings, the most mobile countries are countries like uh, Denmark and Canada. So I mentioned when I moved here from Canada, I, you know, 30 years back, I thought immediately, oh, this is very much class society. I just, you know, one felt it immediately. It's hard to describe, but it's there. Right. And it's 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 all pervasive. It's pervasive in the way in which there are elite schools versus podunk schools. It's it's uh, uh, there's an obsession over status, which I found striking. Um, so, it, yeah. But uh, in particular, you know, when you compare us to other countries, the bottom tenth of our population the kids of the adults in the bottom 10th will stay in the bottom 10th or bottom 20%. And the kids from the top 10% will stay in the top 10% or the top 20%. So that's aristocracy, right? Um, and, and what would you want to do? Supposing you said to yourself, look, what I really want to do is have a mobile society. What I really want to do is fulfill the promise of Abraham Lincoln. What would that mean? Well, Lincoln, remember, was not what was a progressive. He was not a right winger. His internal policies were those of a Whig in many respects. And he did things which were motivated by desire to promote mobility, um, land grant colleges, um, 
his his, um, Homestead Act, for example. If you wanted to carry that further and look at a highly, highly mobile society like Denmark, there are a few other things you would do. You would revise your your university policies. In other countries, uh, you know, politicians decided it would be a good thing if more people went to college. But we're going to make this deal with the universities. We'll guarantee student loans, but then the colleges have to be told to cap tuition. We didn't do that, and that was a corrupt bargain with higher education in this country. Right? Um, so I'd, I'd be in favor of, if not capping tuition, at least eliminating government loans for tuition greater than, say, 25000 a year. I'd also uh, suggest we do things like look carefully at um, at student loans, at extending bankruptcy protection to students, and I'd also I'd also consider the possibility of something like a, a form of national health for catastrophic medical conditions, that, which most Americans would support. Very early on, by the way, I told Jerry Kushner that you know. Canadian Medicare is a lot better than people say, but we can do a lot better. And the next day, Trump repeated that line. People don't realize the extent to which that was a progressive conservative campaign. Question for you on the the aristocracy we have in America. I'm I'm very supportive of you know efforts to make America more of a mobile society, and I, and I agree with you that conservatives should focus more on economic inequality. But I'm I'm curious because you know I think we're still going to have the aristocracy even with those reforms with us in, in one shape or another. And so I'm curious when they are as far, far gone today as, the, as they are in America, um, is it possible to actually reform the, the, the tastes, the habits, the, the virtues of our current arist- aristocratic class, or do you have to discipline them or punish them in some way? What, what is the best way to actually redirect the incentives to get them to behave more, virtuous, more, more virtuously? Well, I'm a Humean, and David Hume said that, you know, any effort to reform the morals of your voters is going to come to naught. Uh, I just don't think it, it can be done. I also have no quarrel with people in Menlo Park who are left wing. If, if they want to be fine, people can vote however they want. Uh, I also recognize that in a mobile society, you're going to have big differences in terms of outcomes. I mean, there'll be some hard workers and some smart people and some lucky people, and they'll be they'll do very very well, and others will be left behind. That's that's simply going to work itself out. I don't have a problem with that at all. I think I think that kind of opportunity society is a good thing. What I have problems with are the artificial barriers, which are the ones I described and can be laid at the door of a democratic party. I wonder if some of what you're talking about. Has, I mean, there are at the abstract level outside of the specific policy debates, there are then always have been debates within American conservatism about the role of the equality principle. And I just spent, you know, the, the, role, last of, summer, the, the role of what? The, the equality principle. Yeah. Equality, right? The, I just spent the last summer out at the Claremont Institute. Marlo did as well. And one of the essays they had us read was Harry Jaffa's famous essay, Equality as a Conservative Principle. Now, the paleoconservatives and a variety of sort of traditional conservatives have always sort of strongly disagreed with Jeff about that. But I wonder if at the abstract level, on the one hand, we're talking about in the contemporary debates, debates between sort of nationalism and classical liberalism or libertarianism versus, you, you know, progressive conservatism. There's a variety of different ways to formulate it, but it seems like you could sort of trace some of these tensions within or debates within conservatism back to there's a lineage for it. And to a certain extent, maybe it might have something to do with the debate over how conservatives should think about the principle of equality. Does that make sense? Or is that a coherent way to think of it? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think what I wanted to interject was a new way of thinking about this based on not a north-south view of America, but an east-west one. And the idea of America as a frontier western country coming to us from Frederick Jackson Turner would identify the GOP as the party of equality and opportunity. So as I say, um, initiative and referendum laws are distinctly Western and distinctly conservative, and they're based on equality. They're, they're, they're based on the idea of everybody getting to vote uh, 
And that being the best way to eliminate unjust hierarchies, right? Jackson was very much an optimist. What Jackson said was, uh, you know, he invented jurisdictional competition, which is another reason why Republicans should like him. What he said was the West competed for people by offering free institutions and equality, and it attracted people from the East for that reason, and realizing it was losing people, the East had to democratize in turn, and that effect, he said, went all the way back to the old world. And so freedom was the gift of Wyoming. Freedom was the gift of the equality state, right? So that's, that's a different way of thinking about American history and world history and, and American politics, to imagine that we're on the side of equality. That's not populism, but that's a... Uh, you know, a, a valid and honorable Republican tradition. And it's embraced by the greatest of American Republican presidents, by Lincoln, by Theodore Roosevelt, and by Eisenhower, who, by the way, said the Republican Party must be progressive or it'll be nothing. I wonder what you make, though, of the conservative critics who have always been a voice with, on the right of the idea of putting equality at the center of the right's political understanding. There is obviously a kind of traditionalist conservatism which emphasizes hierarchy to an extent and worries about the leveling effect of excessive egalitarianism um, and sort of sees, you know, this is maybe a, a conservatism that's more coherent to European conservatism than to American conservatism, but it has been, for example, the paleoconservative critique of the idea of equality as a conservative principle for decades. And it seems like that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you've run into those critics when, when you write about progressive conservatism, but what do you make of their critiques of the idea of equality as a conservative principle? What have they got? What have they got in terms of policies? Who is what is the aristocracy we want to entrench in an American House of Lords? Unless you want to go there, all of this is, you know, mere verbiage that leads nowhere. So, no, I'll, I'll stick with democracy. As, as something superior to what inevitably must turn out to be the, uh, an aristocracy that you're proposing. So I see you then as an aristocrat, and I see myself as a Western egalitarian. And I want to say that egalitarian principle in the Republican Party has been obscured by, on the right, some people who are essentially aristocrats, and 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 by libertarians who uh, who want who are simply theorists and ahistorical theorists. So let's let's you know let's recall that part of the GOP because it was a very honorable party. Okay, and and uh, and I shouldn't want to have people forget about it as they have in the last sixty years. I mean, the Trump victory was a repudiation of the prior 60 years of right-wing Goldwaterism, right? And when you read The Conscience of Conservative, you'll, you'll find it's an attack on an obscure guy called Arthur Larson, who was kind of the brains, uh, the, the brains trust guy behind Eisenhower. So Goldwater was explicitly repudiating progressive conservatism. Uh, but I want to say, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Uh, don't give up on that. And, and in particular, reject the idea that we're divided into classes, some of whom deserve privileges and some of whom don't. Because if that were the case, um, William F. Buckley would have been wrong to give up his support for Jim Crow in 1957, right? But he did, right? Buckley said, I was wrong to oppose the uh, 1957 Civil Rights Bill of Dwight Eisenhower. He apologized for that, which is to say that, that even Buckley thought there was such a thing as progress. As we sort of close out the episode, we talked a little bit at the beginning of the episode of sort of the great figures of progressive conservatism throughout history. Um, I'm curious, outside of Trump, obviously, who's a pivotal figure in all of these discussions, if there are figures in the Republican Party that you see today as potentially representing some kind of renewal 
of progressive conservatism or who are moving the party in the right direction that you're optimistic about? I don't think too many people have gotten it. I do think that the candidate in 2024 should be a governor. I think we should have learned from Trump that it doesn't do to elect somebody who has no knowledge about how to run an administration. And senators don't know that. But we have a pretty good governor here in Virginia. So, you know, there will be people who will, I think, become progressive conservative because they'll be nudged that in that direction by the electorate. As I say, the, the electorate is not a right-wing Goldwaterite electorate. So they'll be nudged in the direction of well, social conservatism, but an economic middle-of-the-road policies. We, we won't hear much, for example, from the kind of people we used to hear from 10 years back who wanted to privatize Social Security. I mean, that, that, that's just gone. One of the interesting things about the 2016 election, by the way, was when you, when you looked at the chart, as I did, only 3.5% of the voters identify themselves as, as libertarians, that is to say, economically right-wing, socially libertarian, and they split their votes evenly between Trump and Hillary Clinton. In other words, they don't count for anything. So you want to hunt where the ducks are. The ducks are in that upper right quadrant, socially conservative, economically liberal. That's progressive conservatism. And we should be happy with that. That's our history. On that note, unfortunately, we're running out of time, Frank, but given your remarks throughout the this episode, occasionally we ask our guests what how they would define conservatism. So I'm interested in hearing what your definition would be. Well, you know, I don't have a one sentence answer. If I did, I really wouldn't be a conservative as I understand the term. I think that ordinary conservatives in the lineage of Edmund Burke, for example, who was a Whig, right, and, and who was on the left on a lot of issues back then, we have a sense of society requiring change from time to time for the common benefit of ordinary people. And we're unable to define where that is without being able to predict where we'll be in the future. So this is more of an attitude defined by desire to make, uh, to seek the common good for all members of your country. There are a couple of things special about being American, however. And one of them is, if you're an American, you have to be proud of your country. You have to be a nationalist. And what that means is you have to subscribe to the American credo. And the American credo is liberal. And that which is not liberal is not American. That's something that conservatives tend to forget. They forget that they are or should be liberals in that sense. They also should recognize that nationalism has a gravitational force towards the left, and that you can't be a proper nationalist without wanting to see that all Americans, you know, whoever you are, will be protected in some way. So that implies making our peace with the welfare state as Dwight Eisenhower did. And that, you know, you know that, that's, that's what people want. So, um, and, and it's faithful to the history of our party. So in that undefined, admittedly kind of mushy way, I define progressive conservatism as a movement that simply seeks the common good of Americans. Well, Frank, we'll close on that point. Thanks again for joining us today. If people want to uh, read more of your work or follow you, where can they find you? On Amazon, where else? You know, the the books are all there. So, you know, they'll, you know, you'll buy my book. You'll make me happy. You'll make my publisher happy. and You'll make Amazon happy. Great. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.